Head out into the Great Plains and you'll likely find a lot of this. Open land as far as the eye can see. Ranchers working from dawn to dusk. It's a place where storms have shaped this terrain for centuries. It's also a spot where once living creatures fade into the landscape. Or do they? All the cervical can come right off. One man making sure dead animals don't fade away is Jay Villamoret, a guy who collects the carcasses of creatures, like this grizzly bear. Jay is figuring out how to piece together the skeleton of this once majestic creature, and he hopes to put the grizzly on display. Here at the Museum of Osteology, we have over 350 actual, real skeletons of animals found living today. Located on the outskirts of Oklahoma City sits this one-of-a-kind museum that anyone can come and visit. Inside is an amazing collection of real animals that once roamed Earth. An assortment of skeletons, large, small, and everything in between. You name the animal and it's probably here. Only presented in a way that we have not normally seen. No skin, no fur, just bones. We are unique in the sense that we are the only skeleton museum in America. Horse? Yep. Right, so horse. which one is uh, the bobcat, beaver? Bobcat, bobcat, bobcat. And kids seem to love it, maybe because it's hands-on. Believe it or not, we actually encourage touching. We always tell people if you're able to touch something, we encourage you to touch. Uh, because how else do they get a, a good feel for what's going on if they don't have the ability to touch? Jay created the museum so humans could touch and learn about animals that populate our world. We actually pride ourselves in the educational aspect behind our museum. We like to say that we couldn't strip the educational value from this museum if we tried. Parents come, they come to tell me how wonderful it was, how great they enjoyed their visit, and best of all, they never realized that you could learn from something so wonderful. This white rhinoceros died at a local facility. It uh, died at a uh, private park and they called us and asked us to come and preserve the specimen. Here we have a fully adult female African elephant. Uh, it came to us again as a carcass and we had to hand clean as much meat off the bones as possible. The museum here is only one part of this amazing place. Think about it, when this animal arrived here, it did not look like this. But to get it to look like this, well, that's where things get interesting. And nobody knows this better than Jay's son, Josh. Josh is taking Wildside TV where museum guests never get to go. Their processing plant. It's here where deceased animals arrive, are cleaned up, their bones reassembled, and are shipped out to museums around the world. A process you have to see to believe. It is a part of life and better yet, it's a part of death. And everything we do in our process is all done in the name of science. That science starts when an animal dies and then arrives here. It could be just the head or the entire creature. It's weighed and then taken to the processing room. The processing room is not for the faint of heart. This place can best be described as a grocery store butcher enters the Chainsaw Massacre movie. It's ghoulish, but all in the name of science. Skulls of giraffes, elephants, and birds litter this room. This man is preparing a bear that will go on display. When an animal arrives to us, it arrives to us as a carcass and we have to hand cut as much meat off the bones as possible. From here, that bear skull is sent to their bug colony room, a room like no other in the world and nothing I have seen before. Inside these tanks are thousands of beetles doing what nature does best, cleaning up. We actually have dermestid beetles, it's a carrion beetle, that its job is to eat tissue from the bone. Sounds gruesome, yet it's the same process that happens to all life in the wild. Have I mentioned the unique odor and smell in this room? It is a smell that you have to get used to. Uh, is it ever a pleasant smell? Do you just, no, it's, it's definitely a smell that I would rather avoid, but it, you know, it comes with the job. Once the beetles do their thing, the skeleton goes into a giant pot where it might sit for a long time. From there it goes into chemicals to be whitened, degreased, and finally preserved. A process that could take four to six months. After it's all clean and looks like what we all recognize as bones, except in a hundred or so pieces, it's sent over to a master articulator, a fancy name for a guy who puts together these skeletons. The hard part, or the most difficult part, would be figuring out how to hold them together neatly. 
You see, Clark has the painstaking task of somehow adhering all those skeletal remains and recreating the animal into its natural state. On this day, he's working on an iguana. I actually just really like building things. When I was a kid, I used to take things apart to see how they worked, and this is kind of the same thing. There's an education element to it. We do a lot of things for uh, universities and museums. So a lot of the stuff that we work on here actually goes for education, which is really nice. Which means Clark's finished masterpieces not only flourish next door at the Museum of Osteology, but they are also displayed at museums around the country, including the Smithsonian. Very tricky ones are either the very small skeletons or the very large skeletons. Um, for obvious reasons, very little ones get tedious and hard to work with because of the, the size and uh, at the same time, the large skeletons are very difficult to work with um, just because of the weight involved. Trying to put together a 40-foot humpback can be quite taxing physically.